Welcome to Linsanity. I'm excited to have my friend Paul Grimberg, who's uh, a partner in our fund and also a, a storied long career in the financial industry. And most famous for, at least to me, is um, traveling the world and getting to uh, eat at the 100 best restaurants in the world. And we're going to talk about those stories coming up. Welcome, Paul. Welcome back to Tokyo. We are in Phoenix, Arizona. You've got probably a little uh, jet lag. Or a lot of jet lag, but either so, way. So, so Paul, uh, welcome to Linsanity. You're a little bit familiar with Linsanity because you've been an LP in social, all three of our funds. All three funds, so, yeah. So I want to thank you. We never get to hang out much in person. Mm -hmm. uh, where are you living these days? I'm spending most of my time in uh, Lake Tahoe, in Klein Village, Nevada. So like every good American who's made a little bit of money, you're trying to get out of California. I am. And <laughs> when I make some more money, I will not be paying 13.3% of that to uh, the California government. Yes. So so uh, we'll get into the California government maybe at some point. But uh, I want to give people a little bit of background. The uh, one, you know, you are currently chairman of the board of Axos Financial. Yes. It's a San Diego bank. It, it was called, people will know it as Bank of the Internet. It's a, That's right. Almost a $2 billion bank. And I want to talk a lot about... Uh, two billion market cap. Two billion market 10 cap. 10 billion asset. Thank bank. you. Right. Thank you. And you've been uh, on the board there since 2004? Yes. Okay. And uh, you just left, you were president of Encore Capital Group. You were That's there right. how many years? 14. So quickly, Encore Capital Group. Purchaser of non-performing consumer debt uh, in the U.S., Europe... Latin America, Asia. And you, your job was just traveling around the world? My job was expanding the business outside of the U.S. and then managing whatever we, whatever we bought outside of the U.S. And how many people at Encore? 7,000 or something like that. Wow. And you got three kids. Everybody's three in kids, California. Grown up, yeah, doing their own thing. And so you're an empty nester like me. Um, I think you're claiming to fame, what, 250 days a year on the road? 275. At your peak or this year? Uh, uh, last six years, probably, on average. So how does the government look at, I mean, software people, we all, like engineers, the world that young people live in, they travel for fun and mm -hmm. you travel for business. It's almost a, a, dead, a, a dead thing. Uh, who, how do you claim residency if you're traveling to? It's wherever your primary home is. So at so the time, the it was in California, home? so it was California. That resident. made no sense then. If you're spending 50 days a year at home, don't make it California your home. Uh, that's right. Yeah, don't. Take my advice in terms of where to domicile yourself when you're traveling. And before this, you were a partner at Deloitte in mergers and acquisitions. That's so for right. for my audience, like the the investing audience, it's like a perfect background to kind of lead off into Linzani, whether you think so or not, because uh, you've got that like training that puts you down on that path. And you know how important it was. It <clears throat> you know we talk about at least young people that I talk about you know, being entrepreneurs and, and, you know, software's eating the world and, you know, there's no balance sheets anymore. It's like depreciation and, and you know, engineers. Mm -hmm. um, no earnings anymore either. Well, I'm not going to get into that. <laughs> and there's different types of compensation. No one can read any of this stuff. So it's, it's become a game, financial statements. So you, we, could, we could delve into that, but then we would probably just confuse everybody. But w how important was learning at Deloitte for what you did? It was a great, great background, and also where'd you go to school? You went to school at uh, before that. Undergrad was Yeshiva University, and I got my MBA at Columbia in Columbia. New York. Okay. Uh, but the, so the Deloitte thing was great. Also, I spent ten years as CFO of Encore, and another seven or eight years as CFO of other companies. So the that deep financial experience was really great to learn how to manage a business because you knew you understood the financials that yeah. went behind the business, and you could think strategically from a financial perspective about how to drive businesses and make them successful. And so now, how old are you? <laughs> 50, no. Seven. 57. 57. That's right. So so I think this is interesting because, you know, we talk about it all the time now. You have, you're retired, but not really. You've just right. retired from, from Encore. At the end of the year, that's right. At the end of the year, um, kids are out of the house. You're mm -hmm. prime, you know, you work out, you take care of yourself. Uh, so you, you're, you want to get, go you're just getting going in a way. I'm starting to have some fun. Yeah. So um, the fun thing that you, you did, which is really, you know, I'm excited to go through this because this is like 
uh, so different is you're a foodie. We met the first time over sushi at sushi at Hane Sushi. Hane Sushi in San Diego. So so Hane Sushi is one of my favorite restaurants mm-hmm. now. Uh, we were introduced by by uh, a third party. Uh, I don't even remember his name. Stefan. Stefan. Uh, which company was he? Uh, he was doing his own little incubator thing at the time. I don't, I'm not sure what he's so, up to. So right we now. had a, we we met over sushi. It's mm-hmm. still my favorite restaurant because I'm not a foodie in the sense of like I won't go to a location. And I'll inquire about good restaurants, but mm-hmm. I don't go to that many different cities. So when I'm in San Diego, that's my favorite place. And then, uh, so we met there. You just finished up. You're coming back from Tokyo after eating at the world's 50 best restaurants of 2017. So w- where did this idea come from, and what was the uh, driving force right. of the whole thing? Well, so actually, just walk the, us through yeah, that. Yeah, well, the world's 50 best restaurants is, uh, they publish a list every year of the 100 best restaurants in the world, why they chose to call it world's 50 best instead of world's 100 best. Got it. Not so clear. Yeah. Uh, and so at some point, I had dined at a number of those restaurants, probably 10 or 15 of them, and they were all fantastic. And then I decided, you know what, I'm going to do the top 50 in that list. And it's spread across every continent? Five continents. They're in 35 countries, 100 plus cities. They're all over the place. And has anybody uh, ever done that? A few people have done the top 50. And then at some point I was working towards the top 50. I had a couple more to do. They were in Russia and South Africa. And then they changed the list on me. And the one because that, 2018 happened? Or because the next, yeah, the next year happened. Yeah. And a, a bunch What's the overlap? What's the turnover on that? Uh, there's there? probably 15, 20% turnover or something like that. So then I just, I, I was either done or. I was going to do something different. I decided, let's just do all 100. Okay. Uh, so I, you know, probably two years ago, I decided to do all 100. And so the last couple of years, I've added probably another 60 restaurants to my list in another 35 cities all over the place. And, uh, and your job allowed you to do this, but this was still out of pocket because you were going to weird places on weekends and organizing family trips around these things. Yeah. You know, I mean, I, I've i flown 12 hours for dinner and then turned around and the flown Sweden back one? the next day. No, that okay, was so actually Okay, so where did you go 12 hours for dinner and back the next day? I, f- I flew to Hong Kong for dinner and then flew out the next day. And? Uh, was it worth that? Uh, that specific restaurant was Hong pretty Kong. good. Uh, Hong Kong's a great city. So for food. If, if I had stayed there a few more yeah, days, maybe so it would have made food sense. food wasn't but that memorable, memorable? No, the food was good, but it was you know, doing anything just for flying anywhere for 12 hours. It's yeah. got to be pretty spectacular. Okay, so you've got this list. Wall Street Journal. Uh, what's funny is Wall, you did, the Wall Street Journal picked up the story. Right. How did, that, how did they pick up the story? Because you're not promotional. So what was the... No, I... I well, the... I was trying to get into this. There's one restaurant that was I was struggling with, a place called Sushi Saito in Tokyo. Yeah. Which, and that's in the movie. Which is... Is that the documentary about no, the sushi that's, place? That's no, different. that's called Jiro. Okay. That's right. easy to get. You can, it's easy to get into Jiro. Okay. It's He's not whored himself out it's, at this point. It's not easy to get into Saito. Eight it's seats, no eight website, seat. no email, no phone. Well, the, there's a phone, but he takes calls once a month, and I recruited dozens of people to get on the phone for hours. They never got through. Uh, so I, I, that was my goal was to get into this, uh, one yeah. restaurant and I, and I couldn't. So I started doing something that I never did in my life as an officer of a public company. I stayed away from social media uh-huh. at all costs. Right. I didn't want any of that, Yep. but I had to get into the restaurant. So I started posting on Instagram and it got around the story. But got that around. was legal to be able to post on Instagram. I yeah, guess yeah, it's just, yeah. no, just posting food yep. pictures got it. and, uh, and the wall street journal and a bunch of other news outlets got a hold of the story and thought it'd be fun to write about some finance guy who's uh, traveling around the world eating and just can't seem to get into that 100th restaurant. But he liked the story better the, without you getting into the restaurant. Yeah, he said, don't he go. He covered the story at yeah. 99. Yeah, he said, biggest mistake I'd ever make is to go to that 100th <laughs> restaurant. Yeah. Because he's all about the story, not yeah. about my goal, obviously. And mm-hmm. uh, So they ran the story. I read the story. They ran the it's, story. It's, uh, how did they do the research to check that you did that? Did yeah, they it, do any research? It, they, or is it fake news? They, they <laughs> In an era of fake news, what did they do? They contacted the organization that publishes the list. Okay. Uh, and to confirm that I had yep. done that. Now, they never check to make sure I did. But I think people recognize, you know, they saw my post. They saw yeah. all the restaurants no, I, I followed went to. It on. I actually 
keep the menus from all of these places. So I have binders and binders of hundreds of menus from all over the world. Right. So I, if I needed to prove it, I could. And no one else came out of the woodwork through all this publicity that they did it. So I think everyone's concluded could that I'm the only guy that's I mean, low end, what would it cost the regular person t- to try and logistically – so you did it all within a year? No, it took uh, it took more more okay. than that. So, what do you think, ballpark over a million to get to all like in terms of travel and time? Like, uh, like I, I I think you're protected in the, the sense that it would take a certain person. Or are there people trying to do this? Is this the, something people are trying to do? The, lots of people try to do the fifty. Okay. There there hasn't been anyone else who's done a hundred. Okay. Uh, there's one guy I know who's got ninety seven out of the hundred. I don't know if he'll do it or not. And did you ever think of making a show about the whole thing or no? I thought you're not, about you're writing not into a that, book, but, but I'm not into that. So I, okay. I just want to enjoy the food. Actually. Okay. And how many of them did you go by yourself? Uh, I probably went to 60 or 70 by myself. Uh, I did a lot of them with my kids yeah. and with uh, Stephanie, my partner. And and, uh, and, and so I, does the Sweden story really interested me? Just because it's so in the middle of nowhere. So how long? So how do you go to Sweden in this restaurant? What's it called? The restaurant's called Favikan. It's in a place called Jarpen, Sweden. Of course. So... F- which is a we all know where Jarpen is, yes. right? It's here, <laughs> that's, that's yeah. right. It's, it's up out there. Here somewhere. It is up there. Uh, so I went from San Francisco to London, and then caught a flight to Oslo, Norway. From Oslo to Trondheim, Norway, and then I stayed at a little town right outside the uh, Trondheim airport. And the town's called Hell, uh-huh. Hell, Norway. And apparently, there, are, I think five or six towns in the world called Hell. There are five or six hells in the world. This is the biggest Hell. Of of all the towns, it's a hell hole. It's a hell, and then you and I drove to from hell to to Jarpen for dinner, and then back to hell at night to to sleep, which was a lot of fun because I was on conference calls and I would be telling people I'm on the highway to hell and I've been to hell and back, and it was quite and, amusing. And as a, as someone who traveled the world, what is it? I, I remember you once showing me a kidnap cart. Is that is that still a thing where executives have to worry about that stuff? Yeah, I mean executives who travel have. KRE, kidnap, ransom, and extortion insurance, so uh-huh. that if someone does take you, uh-huh. you, the, you give them the card. You hand they, them the card. They call a phone number, they pay whatever they negotiate, and then hopefully it never happens, so I don't have personal experience. But have you it. heard of it happening to people? Obviously, I've, it happens. It, it happens to people. Bit. That's why they sell the insurance. So, so it's important to young people, these engineers, these kids at Facebook who just don't know how tough it is out there. <laughs> you would think that some of these kids are, are marked now because there's, there's so many haters. But uh, how, uh, the, was there any flight over the 200? So have you had a close call? Like a pl- uh, plane uh, where you were nervous? Uh, I, I've like had engine s- trouble, emergency landing. I've had a couple forever. where, and I'm sure others have had this, where you're about to land and there's a plane there and then you suddenly no, I are not landing anymore. Right. <laughs> That's happened two or three times. I've had uh, engine problems where the plane just can't go fast enough uh, and there's fear of it stalling, so you have to turn around and go back. Uh, dump fuel after it's taken off? After it's taken off. That's yeah, right. that'd be scary. Yeah. But no aborted. Dumping fuel, going back. Uh, to where you started, but n- nothing. No I'm, f- I still fly. So. No fear of flying. I I don't sleep on airplanes, so that's my biggest challenge: is f- taking red eyes all over the world and coming getting there exhausted. So. So you just watch movies. Watch movies, do work, read. The all right. So now let's get to investing because the the whole thesis of the show is 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 you know Lindsay. I Hennie. have one restaurant investment, by the way. Oh, do you? I do. They're terrible investment. What what restaurant? High end restaurants are. It's terrible investments. Yeah. This one is it hasn't opened yet, but it's gonna be in LA in a very popular area. What kind and of food? It'll be sort of mid tier kind of American California. And why? Type you just know the owner you know the chef? It was one of those things that I all the investing You're I gonna do, lose money. And all the restaurants I eat at I had to own one yeah. restaurant. Okay. Uh, it's all in the lease. Yeah. So if it's a good lease and a good team We'll see. Yeah, it, it's not in the lease. It's just you're not going to make money. The only way to make money is to. Will you have me up. back if I do make money? Yeah, <laughs> okay. I would like to hear about it. Uh, will they let you eat free food? A lot of my friends are doing restaurants, and I just did it in Phoenix. Everybody owns a restaurant. It seems like, and I want to pay them. I don't want the free food. I want them to be successful. So I'll, when, got it. When I do dine there, I will I think pay. that was our problem. Everybody <laughs> just thought it was their restaurant. The and Phoenix is just a, a, a restaurant town in terms of a lot of new startups. They test I- ideas here. So I just never had a good experience. The um, What's your favorite type of food? 
Sushi is my favorite food. Yeah, me too. What's the best sushi? Was it your, was it Saito that was the best food, or where? It was fantastic sushi. But where's the best sushi? Like, if you want to go bang out sushi when you're in the United States, there's some great places in New York. The places we go to in San Diego are phenomenal. Yeah. So if you're in San Diego, I would say Hane, Hane, Ken's, Sushi, Ken's sushi. Ota. And sushi all great, great, all great. And it's kind of that whole neighbor. They've spun it off themselves. They've got three There's or different four people. Do they own all of them, or do they? Uh, they're similar. I, the guys who are the who run the place own most of it, but they have got yeah. some investments. From One the of the things else. I miss most about not living there is I would go once a week. To, that was my mm-hmm. treat of going to those places. My, I used to eat it so much that I. Uh, tested myself for n- mercury and I had eight times the level of mercury in my body. And what could that possibly mean? It means I had to stop eating sushi for because about a year. Because you get cancer or something? No. Mercury poisoning can of impact, you know, your memory and how you think and you brain function you know and I could, organ I function. I may have that. I always just thought it <laughs> was look the ambient. Now you have the reason. <laughs> Holy smokes. I'm going to lay off the sushi. All right. So let's, let's talk about money and investing. The, you were there 2008. And the world was coming to an end. You're chairman of, or you were a board member at a bank. And it was right. a small bank. Bank of the Internet is a branchless bank in, mm-hmm. in well, Axos now. They just right. rebranded it. It's a branchless mm-hmm. bank. So tell me a little bit about that business. Because it's a public company. The ticker is now AX. But AX it used to be New York Stock BOFI. BOFI. And it was, had a great run post-2008, mm-hmm. post-the-crisis. But like, t- like, I just want to go back to, mm-hmm. you know, Back when there were banks, kids today is like Robinhood, Chime, all these neo non-bank banks, and millennials, mm-hmm. uh, to that quaint period when things were blowing up. So, so what was going on in 0809? What do you remember about the crisis? I mean, I I actually remember the crisis more uh, from my uh, Encore days when we would go and visit investors, and investors just wouldn't invest in anything. They thought the world was coming to an end. I yeah. remember being in. Goldman Sachs in New York, and the halls were empty. It was there was no one around. It, it, but did you think it was coming to an end? No. I, look, we were in consumer businesses. They're always going to be consumers. Right. Consumers always are going to uh, borrow money. They need they need it. They need right. money. So, right. that, but no one was listening. No one was listening. Okay. And uh, and all they would do is try to direct how we would manage the business in terms of what their fears were. And we said, look, if you don't if you don't like how you're you know, if, you, if you think the consumer is dying, don't buy the stock, but don't tell us not to not right. to do our business. Yeah. Uh, uh, so uh, I th- I think there was a lot there was a lot of fear there. Yeah. And so at the bank, you guys so so financing the bank back then. The bank was what price? The bank was like a it's it's up to 30, 40 times since then. But like uh, how how, did, how was it working at the bank? Well, the bank has always been very prudent in terms of lending. And so the bank never got aggressive as a lot of... Never needed TARP, did they? Uh, no, never needed TARP. But right. a lot of the... A lot, I mean, the bank was primarily at that time a mortgage lender. Okay. Uh, and people were doing some crazy things, as you know, in, uh-huh. in mortgage lending. But we never, we never did. We were... We, we but you're very, still getting punished. No, getting punished in terms of the stock, stock price, price, but not getting and punished being able in terms to finance of the business. The business and and uh, grow the business. But we were able to continue to grow the business at the time. We were, we were very conservative and prudent in terms of lending practices so all the other banks took significant loan losses uh, but we didn't have to because right. we were very smart about how we how we lent money right and so greg the ceo he's been ceo for i don't know forever it seems 10 years or so so is he know. did he oh, so there was a different ceo when you started there was yes okay and we brought greg in because we knew the bank we needed to grow yep and greg was the right guy to help us grow and now how big's the bank over ten billion in assets and making loans and taking deposits all over the country and got all sorts of interesting products. It's very much focused on technology uh, and uh, being the the technology bank. And um, so, when did it? When did you feel like? Because uh, I know you. Uh, when, when did you? Like, how does it work if you're a chairman and you want to, and you think it's undervalued? Are you allowed to buy the stock, or you? How does it work back in 08, for example? It works, uh, you know, same way then as any time. If you've got material information, you can't buy or sell, and if right. you don't, you, you and can. Do you, and do you are you interested in the stock market at all? Sure. I mean, I've got to. Uh, I've, I, I, if I want to stay retired, <laughs> yes, <laughs> I've got to make sure and that you, I manage my investments appropriately. And do you do it on do you by yourself, or do you have? An I have advisor? someone who helps me with it. 
And uh, mostly ETFs, or is it individual stock picking? You know, I, I do a whole variety of things. So I've got investments in social leverage and all right. three funds of social leverage. And I've got some later stage investments in private equity and uh, some real estate investments and some individual private company investments. And then in the market, individual stocks and, f- and various funds. So it's it's spread in a way to, to manage uh, risk and to just have enough in different asset classes so that I can feel comfortable that the money's going to be there when I need it. And w- traveling the world, wh- where do you, where, where's the most interest? If you were like going to land in a spa and have to restart, like is there a country or an area of the world that's like that was super fascinating or interesting? You know, there, there's w- what, I'm not sure I would live there, but there, there are I mean, Latin America's ex- the middle class is exploding. It's tons of opportunities there. Not uh, Venezuela. Not Venezuela, but in general, uh, you know, f- in terms of financials. Uh, uh, yeah, no, I own a couple of the stocks from the from in the payment space. Stone so, and you know, pa- it's, it's blowing up down there. But India, is India is. I mean, in terms of what's happening in India with the middle class, again, not a place I would live, but in terms of investing, in terms of exciting things that are happening there. Just tons of really. And you've interesting talked about Colombia. So Colombia, where where in where in Latin America? It's like, do you think? I mean, the hot spots. I, the, the hot spots are going to be where the big economies are. So Brazil is going to be a hot spot. Mexico certainly. And what about government, though? Like, so the middle class, like, is the key thing. You need a, a burgeoning middle class. That's exactly right. And is the government changing enough, or is it? Or are we. The, the gov- you have to watch out for the government because yeah. uh, the government can provide opportunity. The government can take everything away, too. So, right. again, you have to be very careful. So fintech in Latin America, for sure. And, you know, in Asia, it, you know, th- there's so many countries now that don't have an evolved financial system. They don't have the legacy that we have here. So fintech and new technologies are going to blow up, I suspect, over time. And you spent a lot of time in India as well. Yeah, at Encore, we had a couple thousand people there, so I spent time there. And I'm actually an investor in a fund that's uh, an early stage fund in India that's doing deals in all sorts of spaces. And so, uh, but you wouldn't live there? No. Uh, if I was going to live somewhere, I, Europe, somewhere in Europe, somewhere, uh, Japan's a fun place uh, to be. And do you speak other languages? I speak American. <laughs> and how is Sometimes it, I speak English. Well, is there any the changes UK. in track because you travel so much? Any changes in attitude towards Americans that you've noticed? It's given our current administration. It's interesting. The is it like you've noticed Americans. a change? It's it, it's. Uh, I was in uh, when I was in Japan a couple weeks ago. I was walking mm-hmm. by the government offices, and there was a massive sign that must have been thirty feet by fifteen feet that says Japan loves Trump. Oh, so they love him. <laughs> and there. so there are certain countries that love him and there are certain countries that hate him. And I've experienced both. You've experienced both. And in terms of like recruiting and everything uh, as you're at Encore, what's mm-hmm. with millennials and et cetera, have you noticed, like what's the change? I know that you said there's WeWorks now for Encore Capital mm-hmm. in different c- parts of the world. What is the biggest difference over the years? Because you were at Encore how many years? 14 years. Yes, yeah, so you were doing recruiting and mm-hmm. hiring and, and expansion. Uh, what, what's it like working with younger people now versus then? What's the biggest difference? I think there, there's uh, less uh, commitment to the organization that they're working for, and they've got a lot of opportunities and lots of uh, and an ability to move. And so there's a lot of movement and doesn't take a lot in terms of financial incentive to get people to move. Uh, so there's not, not necessarily a lot of commitment to any particular organization that I've, uh, that I've seen. And the banking system here, so switching topics, the banking system here, what's changed the most since 08? And wh- where, where's your head around fintech in the United States? Uh, it's been a great opportunity. The question is how much really is, at, at the end of the day, how much is going to be fintech and how much is going to be, how much do you really need true financial services and banking? So right. fintech, uh, and, you know, we, we've seen what's happened in certain spaces in fintech where they've had to become banks. And yes valuations have gone from fintech valuations back to bank. financial services and bank valuations. So Good or bad? I mean, I think it's great. It's the reality. Yeah. I mean, I think the 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 fintech was a, was a dream. Yeah. And if you lend money, you're not a fintech, you're a bank yeah. or you're a lender and you're going to get those kinds of valuations. So the, yes. the question is, will that 
continue to happen and what are those companies that can that can navigate and stay in that fintech space with that valuation and and not become a more traditional financial services and company. Do you are you tech do you like tech or do you like or do you look at the financial service and go under value or do you do you is it you stay at a fintech? Where do you, what, like where are you comfortable? Uh, I don't I don't I have to admit I don't understand it well enough to understand some of these valuations. So yeah. I try to stay where I'm comfortable and where I know it and understand where I can do the math and say, yeah, I, I know what that valuation is all about. Yeah. If I, if I can't do the math in my head, uh, I, then I long term, it's going to be a struggle for me. And what uh, what are you looking at now? So you want to be on board seats. So yeah. obviously, yeah. you know, there's all these startups that, you know, we've backed over 100 companies. Mm-hmm. So there's all these startups that, that uh, they may not understand what it's like to build their, their, their first board. Mm-hmm. What, what can you tell people about how important boards are or not or, you know, how to structure them? Because I know you want to help out and, and chip in at the board level a lot of these companies. So what, can, what have you seen, the good, the bad, and the ugly? What, you know, what do people are missing about boards and where's the, where's the things that people can do to make their boards better? Uh, if you've got the right board with the right mix of people, uh, that know how to work with the CEO and the management team. It can really help drive the business. If you've got people with the right kinds of experience who've made the mistakes or seen how the mistakes have been made, who've seen how to grow quickly, what infrastructure you need to put in place, what you need to watch out from a regulatory perspective, from a, a competitive perspective, uh, you can. I think it can really help accelerate a company. So a CEO... Uh, who has a board that's a that's got the right mix of people where he can leverage the, that talent and that knowledge can really use it to to grow his or her business. But is there any rules in terms of ownership or where you've seen troubles with like people owning enough of the stock or or like do you, if you were investing in a company mm-hmm. would you look at the board? Forgetting seed stage, but like at a public company, do you do you check who the board is? Without a doubt. Okay. Uh, without and doubt. what are you looking for mainly? Mainly what they own of the company, or the, they're, one their experience and to what they own. I mean, there 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 are professional board professional boards that are just paid board members in different countries all over the world, and they don't, in my view, don't have enough skin in the game. I think it's important to have skin in the game, right? Uh, because then you pay attention. Uh, and you're focused on the value that you're creating together with the team and with the rest of the board. Right. And what? how many boards can you think you can be on reasonably? Like, like the, the venture capital is actually guys on 10 to 12 boards. Is that possible? I don't or? think. I, I, I don't think so. I, to, to, to devote the amount of time that can really help the business, I don't think you can be on more than four or five boards. And then it depends. Are they time. public companies? Are they private companies? Are they large? Are they small? There are different levels of commitment depending upon the business and how it's capitalized and whether it's public or private. Once you've been traveling, is it easy to get off the road or is it, do you think you're just never going to be able to sit still? It's hard to sit still. Yeah. I I retired at the beginning of the year and I've been gone out of the country six weeks already. And, uh, when I'm at home more than a week or so, I'm itching to do something and get somewhere. Yeah, me too. I wonder if it's a generational thing. You have three kids, so the range age... Uh, what 26 age? to 31. Are you seeing a different behavior patterns? Like, I was cool just being sitting around. Mm-hmm. I wasn't a big explorer. I like traveling, but I, it, traveling sucked. Now traveling's so different, so I wonder, is it, it, it is, are you seeing them loving to travel? No, they're, they, I travel a lot more than they do. Yeah. And they, they actually enjoy sticking at home. But, I mean, they like traveling and doing fun things, but not regularly, not, not like I did. And what's the biggest – I mean, did you book your own travel or did you have somebody do it? When I uh, was working full-time, I had someone help me. Okay. Generally, I, I'm pretty anal about that, so I want to know – where I'm going and what seat I'm sitting at in the airplane. <laughs> yeah. So what do you? What are your ha- like? What like as someone who like I use Google Flights. Uh-huh. I use hotels tonight. Uh, so I do my own stuff and right. I'm last minute. And I don't like getting charged for changes, so I like to book at the very last minute. And are you? I'm the about opposite that? of that. So you want to know well, weeks out in advance because I'm generally trying to. St- eat at a really nice restaurant when I'm going somewhere. Even and now? Even, even now. now. Yeah, okay. I still enjoy it. So you it. plan it around. So I plan it. So I, if I know I have to travel, I'm going to do it ahead of time because sometimes it takes two or three or four months to get a reservation. But you've already done the Top 100. You can't chill and just relax? There's, you know, 130 three-star Michelin restaurants in the world, and I've eaten at 
115 of them, and I've got 15 or 20 more to go, so I want to eat at all those. And uh, Which country has the, be- has the best, the most? Has the most? Yeah. Fr- uh, French? Uh, no, the most three stars is Japan, actually. And then next? Probably France. And where does America fit in in the food? America's actually uh, evolving. It's, uh, it's getting more and more uh, great restaurants. So and the weirdest place with a great restaurant in the United States is where? On the list. The weirdest place, that I, not a, the most remote place, oh, on the list. Yeah. On the list, there's nothing remote in the United States. It's either okay. San Francisco, Chicago, or New York. Uh-huh. Uh, there's a great restaurant in a little island called Lumi Island up near Washington huh. where you actually have to put Take your car on a ferry uh-huh. to get over there. Great and restaurant. And what kind of food? Uh, Nordic food, actually. Okay. And um, to to young people, so with with the traveling, was there any hacks that you use, or you book ahead and, and use Expedia, or like, what, were there any travel sites that are like secret travel sites? No, I just I stick with uh, st- I try to stick with the same program, so the same ally- airline alliance. So I have status on Star Alliance and One World. Does it really make a difference? Is it keeping it does. track of the points. No, it's the pl- it's if you get to a certain level, you you know you, you get treated well. So you board the plane first. If you're making a connection, they'll hold a flight for you. Uh, and internationally, your business. Yes. And, and the best airline, in terms of like the coolest uh, plane you've been uh, on. You know, Singapore Airlines is great because they have the cabins. Uh, Emirates has cabins. Uh, so those are obviously very cool. All right. So wrap up. Uh, Latin America for fintech. India, tremendous growth. Anywhere where there's a growing middle class. And, so keep it simple. And, and they don't have an infrastructure already. So th- th- you're not trying to convert someone from something else. You're just introducing it new to them. Yeah. And have you been successful with the seed investing? Like beyond us? Like, mm-hmm. I mean, is it something that you get excited about? Or are you getting pitched other stuff? Or like, are your kids sending you stuff? Or like, where's the network now? Like, how are you going to position yourself? Are you just going to go with your old network? Or, or what's, what's post-retirement look like? Yeah, I go with what works. And so social leverage has worked and other things have worked. And I'm going to continue to do that. Uh, I really, like, I, I never get a chance to uh, spend time with you, so it's great you're, you're out here for the weekend. Um, uh, I appreciate it, and uh, I'm excited for your your post-banking uh, uh, world. It's uh, I'm looking forward to a fun weekend. All right.